This is a, a, a panel of folks who are working actively in rural communities around the country and doing really interesting work that they want to talk to you about and that I want to hear them talk more about. Um, I'm Melissa Block with NPR. I've been uh, on a reporting project over the last five or six months, traveling around to communities around the country, mostly small communities, and, and looking at how place shapes identity. And the three people who are here are invested in all of those questions at a local level in really interesting ways. Um, Molly Hemstreet, to my right, is the founder of Opportunity Threads in Morganton, Western North Carolina. It's a worker-owned textile company, uh, also part of a network of small-scale textile plants throughout the region that are committed to bringing back North Carolina's textile jobs through innovation, um, also making worker equity, dignity, and democratic participation a real part of the equation. Um, some of the, the products also locally sourced is one of her her um, colleague says it's working from dirt to shirt. Mm -hmm. So this is Molly. Uh, to her right is Rob Riley, president of the Northern Forest Center, which is based in Concord, New Hampshire, but they work throughout Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York, creating jobs and conserving forest land, fostering solid stewardship of the land and reducing carbon emissions along the way. And on the far right, Kelly Ryan, who is the CEO of the philanthropic group Encourage in central Wisconsin. Uh, another Wisconsinite, can't have too many on these right. panels, finding ways to build and promote a sustainable, connected community and economy. Um, and it's interesting that Charlie and I both had picked up on the same article about the Kaiser Family Foundation Washington Post poll about rural and urban divides and how folks see things. Just two points that I wanted to point to that bear on our conversation a little bit. Um, one, and maybe the most striking for me, was that in this poll, six in 10, almost six in 10 rural residents said they would encourage young people to leave and look for work someplace else, which is a really striking number. I think it, it says a lot about where we are and, and the kind of work that these folks are trying to do to build community and to keep those young people in place. Um, another one which, which we may talk about as well is um, a gulf over immigration and changing demographics. In this poll, 42% of rural residents say immigrants are a burden on the country in urban areas, that's just 16%. So I just toss those things out for you to think about as we, as we start the conversation. And they may or may not hold true for the places that we're talking about. Um, I want to talk to each of you about how you define rural, where you're from. I can tell you I'm from a town, I grew up in upstate New York, a town of 200 people, uh, gas station, post office, general store, and a bar. And there's no longer a gas station. So that's my rural. Uh, Molly, what's your rural? Sure, so my rural is Western North Carolina, and just to fit into your stereotype, I do play the fiddle. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, my rural, rural is deeply about place. I was one of those young people that left um, and had the privilege of going to a four-year university in North Carolina, but I was also one of those young people that felt deeply called to come back. Mm -hmm. So rural for me is about return. It's also about looking at our heritage and our manufacturing and not putting that to the side, but saying there is a future and that there is opportunity there. And that is a lot of what my, my rural is about. Okay, Rob? My rural is the largest intact forest east of the Mississippi, about 30 million acres. We have an abundance of trees, water, mountains. 70 million people live within one day's drive and they come to visit and experience all the, the uh, natural resources, the recreation we have to experience. It's also, my role is um, working with my hands growing up on my family's farm, uh, working with a team of horses, pulling logs out of the woods, picking stones out of the fields. Um, my family apparently saw Ohio, they said, we're out of here. Uh, <laughs> it's too much water and stones, but I guess that the similar to Molly is that the, the calling home to northern New England really is about a sense of place. The rolling hills of southern Vermont are just, you know, they call to me, they, they, uh, they feel comfortable. Even the mosquitoes sometimes feel like a comfort, <laughs> oddly. You know your home, I, I can't, that, that's not true. Um, point is, is that you know where, when you're home. It feels right, it smells right, um, and that's why I do the work I do. And Kelly, what's, uh, what's your rural from central Wisconsin? Well, um, my rural is central Wisconsin, so um, um, our rural is about an area that was uh, predominantly dependent on the paper industry for over a century. And there's a visual. Um, it's a small area that we serve. It's about 45,000 people. Um, it's, um, it had been the 
smallest city in the US to be home to the headquarters of a Fortune 500 company for over a century until the year 2000. And after the sale and move of the headquarters, we lost about 40% of our total employment in three years. But today, um, 17 years later, manufacturing still comprises about 35% of our total employment. Um, we are growing manufacturing jobs. We are an uh, agriculture economy. We're the largest producer of cranberries in the world, in central Wisconsin. Um, and um, my role is about helping this community that identified as a paper-making community for over a century, and individuals that grew up multiple generations with an identity that I'm a paper worker, realize that we can be about so much more. We can change and shape a new narrative and value all of the human beings that live in our place. Molly, let me ask you, a lot of folks have sort of a defining moment that leads them to do what they do. Um, and I think a lot of us are familiar with what happened with the, the textile industry in North Carolina, also the furniture industry, um, and how steep a decline there has been. What was it specifically that made you think, this is where I want to go, this is where I want to be, and this is the work that I want to do in trying to revive this and figure out a new form of innovation to bring it back? Mm -hmm. So I think I have two. Uh, I want to introduce you to one of my coworkers. I think he's on a, a slide here. His name is Walter. And um, when I left my community um, and came back, actually came back as a public school teacher, it was a time when our um, unemployment had hit 17%. So there was, I, I lived in this really interesting time of kind of the boom of manufacturing and then this complete exodus almost overnight of so much of our work leaving. And when I came back into my community, back into our public school system, I realized how hard it is to teach any type of social change or any type of upward mobility when the economy has been pulled out from under you. So I asked the question and really wanted to then get into business to say, how are we going to bring work and how are we going to bring work back? At the same time, there was a really interesting go thing going on in my community, and we have a lovely little downtown, we're a little southern town, and we have the craft breweries, which are really hot now. And then a few blocks down the road from my, com my community, there is a chicken processing plant, there's a slaughterhouse. Because a lot of what happens in rural communities is we do the dirty work, <laughs> we do the hard work that urban communities often benefit from. And there's an unprecedented thing that happened at this poultry processing plant is they decided to unionize. And what they did at this process, poultry processing plant, there's actually a book written about it called The Maya of Morganton, written by Leon Fink, who was at UNC Chapel Hill. And I watched these workers go on strike, many of them primarily immigrant, um, Mayan indigenous, and they organized their work, poultry processing plant and they won. And then I watched being a right to work place, a right to work state, the systematic dismantling of these organized workers. So it was into this context of a very high unemployment and watching when workers organize, and even though they try to organize to have a voice and have equity in their workplace, it's, systemat it's systematically disassembled. So what is a new way of bringing work back? What is a new way of organizing ourselves? What is a new way of em empowering workers? What is a new way of creating workplaces where we can struggle with these questions because the, the organized labor has not been doing it for us. So I became driven by this question and decided to start a worker-owned textile plant. Um, so fast forward, we now have 10,000 square feet, 25 workers, and it was really that moment that made me want to think about how we do work differently. And there's a second moment. So I want you to kind of pull back into your mind that stereotype, which probably is still there, of the dusty mill and the lint heads and so there's this wonderful woman named Doris that lives down the, um, has a plant down the road from us. I walked into Doris's plant one day and she was systematically or simultaneously making um, cheerleading outfits for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders <laughs> and mastectomy wear, customized mastectomy wear. Doris can make anything. And she came to me and she said, um, you know, Molly, I want to support you. Even though I we were setting up as being her competitor, she was saying, I want to support you. Because if we're not in this industry and we're not in this work of rebuilding these industries together, then what's the point? And so that really led me to our second slide, which was to think about not just being a one-person plant that's worker-owned, but can we then, across Western North Carolina, really build an economic enclave of these small plants? Because we see what's happening in manufacturing is we're moving from 
the artisan mentality to these large plants that many of them have offshored, but the growth in manufacturing is in the micro factories of five to 75 people. And so what we've been able to do is build a, a manufacturing network of all these small companies that are in heritage manufacturing. So we're not just one plant of 25 people, we're now 15 plants of 400 people. And it is there where we're starting to build democratization of the workplace to give workers a voice because that is what has happened to rural America and that's what has happened to my community is workers no longer have a voice or an identity. And let me pivot to you, Rob, in terms of how you are reimagining the forests of the Northeast and the work that you're doing and how you see it changing the conversation about stewardship of the land. Great, and I'll show you just a, a quick uh, map here of the region we're talking about. That green swath is the northern forest, and of course it does extend up into Canada. But the appealing part of this work to, for me is it's complicated, right? These are, these are heady, tremendous economic people issues across four states, uh, across uh, generations, and I think that as we look at this region, this was the birthplace of the modern paper industry. We did precede, I think, Wisconsin by a little bit. International <laughs> paper, just a little bit. International paper grew up here. The, uh, so that's on the industry side. On the conservation side, the Weeks Act in 1902, I think it was, um, was the, the advent of the, more, sort of the, the U.S. forest system up in the uh, White Mountain National Forest protecting uh, watersheds. We've been at the advent of innovation for a number of years, but something happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s where a lot of the mill communities across this region that at one point received the highest per capita income in their states as a result of, these, of the mill driving economic engines uh, were much more susceptible to overseas for different uses of, of land, for different uses of, of paper products. And the, the big question now is how do we reinvent this economy and how do we do it in a way that engages people within that? Um, I think to bridge the earlier conversation, I think there is a mentality to some degree in some rural places that they've been done unto by forces from Boston, conservation initiatives, by policy and regulation from, from DC or by the state capitals. They don't understand that we, as people of the North Country, as we call this, are also stewarding our land. We have the same end goals, but our job today is on the line. So the, the challenge for my organization, I think our organizations, is how do you have the sense of immediacy, person's job, and looking across that four state map or on a regional basis or in a community, how do you reinvent that economy such that you are relevant to the marketplace, relevant to these market trends and things that are coming at us, and uh, a balancing uh, what is a real tension out there for uh, who owns what, and I'm saying owns literally and figuratively, who benefits, and for, um, and, and for what future purpose. And I think those, those themes weave through our work. So as we look at, at this from the Northern Forest Center's perspective, we have a, an a, un, un, uh, un um, uh, what's the right word? Uh, let's see, I can't even find the word. It's not a glamorous term. We have three buckets of work. You know, the first bucket is really retooling this forest economy, looking at how we um, provide greater value out of the northern hardwoods, which are only grown here. Uh, maple, oak, in some cases it's grown elsewhere, of course. Ash, um, and then we have northern uh, uh, softwoods as well, which contribute to the building trades. So we have uh, fine furniture makers that are selling up and down the eastern seaboard uh, across the country of, of wonderful products that are made by people of this place. But how do they do that m more effectively? How do they do it with greater margins? Um, within our energy sector, we, we use 80% of the nation's number two heating oil. It's carbon intensive, it's from somewhere else, and we have a lot to heat during the winter. It helps with our skiing industry, it doesn't help when we have to heat that. So we're using local wood to heat, and it's our comparative to local agriculture. You like to Eat locally, here's an opportunity to heat locally, and by doing so, you have 50% less carbon that you're using or, or that you're emitting. Um, the other piece is local uh, recreation. I would say that this region, perhaps uniquely positioned, maybe not, as I said before, within a day's drive is 70 million people who enjoy skiing, hiking, solace out in nature. Uh, with the nature deficit disorder, we all need to be hear the rhythms of nature. So how we create a a culture of entrepreneurism across this region from a culture that was a owned essentially by single drivers within these communities is 
a generational prospect, not a 10-year prospect, not a five-year, it's systemic. The other area is really targeting specific communities and how do communities have the building blocks. You may not know this, maybe you all are victim to this as well, but your cell phone does not work in half the places in this region. Your, your upload download speeds are not helpful when you actually want to download a image. Um, we are at a, a very uh, significant disadvantage. Go back to 40 years of rural electrification, we've got to jump ahead with technology to really tie in this region so it can be in best service to those visitors and for those people who are working there to derive their value. And one of the things I want to point out there is that we are seeing more and more people searching for a sense of place. How do they connect to a landscape and small communities where they can have an entree point where their kids can walk to school? And the northern forest, rural places afford that. But we have to have broadband. We have to have quality schools. We have to have quality health care. We have to have quality housing stock. And unfortunately, in many cases, we've had deferred maintenance for 50 years on all of those issues. Let me, let me, so, so if I could just add yeah. one other quick thing. We also have to take this message of innovation and how we retool these to our political leaders, both on the, on the state and federal levels, because they perceive, and I'll uh, maybe overgeneralize, that rural is all the same, and one policy structure fits all of rural, and it's not the case. We have to have different flavors. Well, let me rural is generally treated as a subsidy program in the federal government. Yeah, but and Kelly, why don't you talk a little you want bit to talk about, about inspiration? Yeah. yeah, well, inspiration or also just the notion you, you raised the, the point before of having one big company that was the driver of the, right, of the economy right. um, pull out right. and what happens then. Right. So how you embed right. power within the community as right. opposed to the sort of paternalistic, mm -hmm. right. very daddy paternalistic, model. Very dependent um, and a strong sense of entitlement from multiple generations growing up and expecting to have um, uh, full employment um, at a more than livable wage. Um, and when that's gone, it creates a vacuum of leadership because really leadership was provided by the company. Um, it provides a, va a vacuum of economic development infrastructure, so everything was in furtherance of the paper industry. How do you diversify an economy over time? I want to go to the question about um, inspiration mm -hmm. and because I think it speaks to kind of our approach and our work. And there were two specific things that inspired me and us in this work. Was, um, you know, shortly after the sale of that company, and people were in a lot of pain, um, fear. And uh, we're a traditional community foundation, which meant we were raising money and we were writing grant checks. And that was about it. And the community was crying and saying to us in focus groups, we want you to create jobs. And we said, what is our role in creating jobs? We're pretty good at writing scholarship checks and this was maybe 15 years ago. And the things that became inspirational for us and helped motivate thinking, because if you think about one company, it's fairly insular, a fairly insular culture, was to take people out of the community and see what were others doing to motivate new thinking and see that you know, if North Carolina, uh, after the demise of textile and tobacco, could look at what their arts, heritage, and culture was to help produce um, economic growth, and perhaps we could do the same in central Wisconsin. One of the most inspiring and I think instructive to us in our work and our role was a trip to Northern Ireland. And, um, and it helped us migrate away from being just a grant maker and a check writer. And what we saw in Northern Ireland was a community trust that was using all of its capitals, not just its financial capital, its human capital, social, political, reputational, to be on the ground, boots on the ground, working with human beings to restore trust, forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation, and understanding that if those core tenants don't exist in community, you're not going to build a long-term sustainable economy that really, as we think about community as a framework for change, it's about the sense of shared values, shared stewardship of place, um, and of each other. And that, uh, that experience for us as a traditional grant maker gave us then context, if you will, you know, and perspective on our own situation where we came back and we have really spent the last 15 years transforming our institution and how we approach our work. And we believe our role is to create the enabling conditions for change to happen in that place, to build trust, relationships, and a shared sense of, res of responsibility for place and for its future. 
And that has played out in a number of different specific ways. The second piece I would say that inspires me or angers me or keeps me going is um, uh, a recent, fairly recent comment, I'd say maybe three or four years ago, when I showed that aerial before, um, if you want to put the second aerial up right now, um, that previous aerial where you saw the Wisconsin River running kind of right through our community, it runs right through our downtown. And heretofore, all of that river frontage is controlled by the paper industry, or was controlled by the paper industry, right? So our, develop, our downtown sits right in the middle of that Wisconsin River where the bridges are. No development on the riverfront because it was controlled to produce power to make paper. That river was a working river. So for many, many years, it was dirty and polluted, right? It's cleaned up, but the community itself has to change how they see that river as a source of an asset for community. Um, the comment that really inspired me or angered me was um, looking at downtown development was a comment from someone who had been a traditional uh, uh, community leader, uh, someone who would have been in a, a, a role of power and privilege and wealth, uh, said, you know, really what uh, the flawed logic that Encourage uh, displayed by thinking that the average person in this community should have a say in what happens in their downtown. And so what we did was we bought a vacant Gannett newspaper building. Now, there's a comment right there for an entirely different session, mm -hmm. a vacant Gannett newspaper building in the center of our downtown on the river. And we bought it with intentionality. We turned over the decision making to the community. What would happen in that building? We hired a firm from New Orleans that specialized in working after Katrina in parishes to get the people that lived in those parishes involved in dialogue about what kind of housing did they need. Not the federal government coming in and saying this is the housing we're going to give you. So really user-centered, community-driven process where individuals gain a sense of agency, right? That my voice matters. Uh, in a community, and in our case, and I'd say probably applies in many across the nation, where um, decision-making and power, control and information was fairly concentrated in the hands of few. And so to change that perception about what's my role, if I'm labor versus management, um, am I able to speak up uh, against the company that you know, provides the paint for the color of my house? Um, we're talking about kind of uh, deeply embedded norms that we have to help equip people with the confidence to take baby steps to engage in shaping the future of their own community and feel a sense of ownership. So my last comment on this is um, uh, uh, what this represents here is an example of how our organization changed over time. So we really have examined how we do business as an organization. Are we using all resources we have to advance equity, opportunity, and a sense of shared stewardship in that place, including our investment portfolio? This is an example of doing away with what we would call a traditional annual meeting where we would hold a cocktail party for our donors who wrote us checks, and we would hold up some wonderful nonprofits for the work they did in the community, and we'd have about 200 people. It was not accessible. It wasn't really inclusive to the entire community. And if we're really about building a community that works well for all, um, this example was doing away with the annual meeting and saying we're going to host a community picnic. And we did this five years ago. And we thought, how, you know, it's open to the public. We're going to focus on providing local food. And the only requirement, it'll be free, the only requirement is that you meet someone from this community that you do not know, so that we're fostering connection and relationship. And the first year, we thought maybe we'd have 500 people. We had 1,000 show up. And we had a call from a farmer that said, what can I bring to the picnic? And he brought 1,000 ears of corn. This it's very cool. Um, this is last year's picnic. We had to move it downtown to the banks of the river. That's the Tribune building on the left, that circular building. Last year, we had 7,000 people show up for the community picnic. We had um, all local food donated by local food vendors. That same farmer hit 20,000 ears of corn last year, donated, and two football teams to shuck the corn, right? That doesn't sound like economic development, but it is in terms of creating the kind of long-term sustainable change that we need to have happen. And I would suggest to you, it is not just in rural communities, it's in urban, and it is for all of us as a nation.
I want to. You're, uh, you're making me want some corn right yeah, now. So. Yeah. Um, Two weeks. <laughs> I want to get back to that notion of how to keep young people in place in small communities, which I think is, is a hurdle so many places around the country are trying to deal with. Um, and I think you've alluded to some of it. You need connectivity. You need broadband. But beyond that, what keeps young people from thinking that to be successful is to move away, to go to a big city, to do the next shiny big thing that is not where they're from, when so much primacy has been on striving and achieving and leaving and going farther or beyond where your parents were. Um, Molly, do you want to take that on first? Sure, I'll start there. So I think let's it's try to, I know we want to get to questions, so let's try to keep yeah. it. So I think it's interesting to look at, as I described, this arc of a lot of strong um, manufacturing in the 80s and 90s, the leaving of that. And then it's really interesting with this renaissance in manufacturing, if you drive down 70, Highway 70, where a lot of these manufacturers are that they're producing for Crate and Barrel and Restoration Hardware, um, everyone has a for hire sign out. And so unfortunately, I think what we've said is to prepare people for a workforce where there's actually really good paying jobs is to shift it to technology. We need to, and we do need to do that. We do need to teach skills around technology. We do need to have the most automated cutter so that we can, we can be competitive and like Rob was saying, be able to meet the markets so that we don't have the exodus of this work again. But I think we're also fundamentally losing out on what holds people to their work is also that there's equity and that there's voice in their workplace. So if as a young person, you don't just want to go in and work for someone to, to create more and more wealth for that person, that one family that's owned you, most of your community for generations upon generations. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this opportunity for equity and voice in the workplace to really hold a new generation of workers into, into work, into manufacturing work. And I think we have to be creative in how we do that. And that's why we feel like worker ownership is such an important piece of driving and bringing a millennial workforce back into manufacturing. And how much of this goes back to schools and what is taught, either what is taught in school or the path on which students find themselves, whether it's in high school or in community colleges or local colleges. Mm -hmm. um, does that tie in with, with your, your work? Robert? Yeah, workforce development is always a challenge. I mean, we, again, underemployment and lack of uh, skilled um, applicants is, is pervasive in our region, too. But I, I do think that to your, to your original question, there is a notion of young people beget young people. They want to be around their peers. Right. And I think that when you know, we see the trends and the, and the demographics, so there's less and less of them. But what is turning around in our region is when people look at where they want to play is where they want to start living. Mm -hmm. And is there a coffee shop and is there a brew pub? I mean, it's, it's the new social gathering places that I think allow for an, an entry point that does not need, require credentials. Mm -hmm. In a, in a rural community, my, in where, I, oops, where I grew up, my, gener, my uh, family's there for 10 generations. I went away, I came back, and I kind of, like, the ticker went back to zero. Um, you know, we have a tendency to hold people at a distance. So the thresholds for entry into neutral places in rural, in rural America is really significant. So mountain biking in our region is becoming quite a growth opportunity. And we see thousands of people coming to this place in, in northeastern Vermont called Kingdom Trails. It also is in the region called the, the Northeast Kingdom, which is very cool, I think. Um, but that is becoming a place where the school system is growing, renewable heat is taking off, um, it's connected, uh, there's a, um, increasing young people, it's creating its own sense of excitement. And I think it's more opportunities like that where you can have a neutral entry point, where you have high recreation, you have broadband, and you're, it does help if you're on a highway. Kelly, so what, what keeps young people, young people where question. you are as yeah. opposed to moving um, to a big city? So one of the comments earlier um, when Charlie and Bill were up here you know, made me think about one of our manufacturers uh, that we work with probably seven years ago did a poll of his employees. Would they recommend to their child or grandchild uh, to A, work in the industry, manufacturing, and B, return to the community? 94% said no, they would not advise that they return to the community. So there's something about the, the narrative that parents and grandparents and maybe the pain that they've experienced, right? Um, I also think it has a lot to do with respect. And does the community, does the culture 
authentically respect young people, young voice. They have power uh, and agency to make decisions and to create the kind of community that they want. Um, and then the, the, the other thing I would say about young people is that process I talked about with the vacant newspaper building, we call it the Tribune building. Um, the two years of monthly meetings coming together to talk about what do we want in this building. What was very cool was we had um, Skype screens there where we had college students who had moved away from the community Skyping in to participate in this process about what they wanted in their downtown. And 18 months into that process, we did an evaluation because what we would say to the community every time we had people together was, this is about more than a building, right? This is about the experience that we're having together, about what's important to us, building trust, et cetera, and prioritizing and, and demonstrating that if we get engaged, we can make something happen. That midpoint evaluation survey showed that the people that participated had a greater sense of optimism and of hope for the future. And I think if you don't have optimism and a sense of hope in place, young people do not want to return to a place where they feel there is no opportunity. What would you say, we've been talking about the successes that you've had and the ways that things have been working, but I, I want to flip that on its head just a little bit. What are the, what are the real structural hurdles that just keep you up at night or make you feel like you're banging your head against the wall? Um, Rob, I'm going to start with you. Um, that's a very big question. Um, I think that traditional uh, political structures are challenging. Counties um, don't mean the same as they used to, and that that, that power structure still tries to retain um, its sense of of con not control but influence. Um, in our neighborhood, um, four different states and the different flavor of how politics run in those different states influence. Um, how decisions are made. New York State is very significant on public funding and that drives um, so much of what goes on. In Maine, for example, it's very philanthropic led and the state is not really a significant participant. Um, I would say that, that the other piece that, that I'm challenged by is, is continuing to look at the connection between rural and urban places because I think as we the theme that keeps coming up is what's the disconnect there mm -hmm. and I don't think that necessarily there is a radical disconnect people in rural and urban places want better things for their children mm -hmm. they want good schools they want safe places they want clean air they want clean water I just think the path between here and there is one that's seen as um, more opportunistic in some places versus another the lack of the, this, the sense that opportunity is lost in, in rural places, I think, is, is, is a challenging narrative, one that we know is false. So I think that the challenge that we have is how do we continue to uh, elevate the entrepreneurs that we're working with, that we're taking philanthropic and public funds and getting behind, because there's two different ways, I think, to look at this. One's an institutionalist. Like how do you create the system? The other one is how do you work on exactly those entrepreneurs who need to work through that system? Set the table, get the people there. Those are the way we pull together. That's how we're trying to, I think we collectively up here are trying to drive that change. But how do you amplify those stories in just the, the sheer mass of communications out there? Mm -hmm. So I think permeating that so that urban places know that rural shares some, some fundamental values, and there's a lot to offer there. Kelly, what's standing in the way of your doing everything you would want to do? What are the, what are the challenges or the hurdles? Doing everything we would want to do. Um, well, so I think the challenges, um, as I thought about them in advance, were um, uh, when you're trying to shape a culture of agency, that everyone has a voice and everyone matters, um, and about sharing power, someone is giving up power when you're sharing power, right? And um, and there is a propensity uh, when losing power to engage in undermining behavior, right? So that's, that's an ongoing challenge for us in a place that had been you know, highly paternal and uh, concentrated power. I think the other thing is um, uh, understanding return on investment. So to what do we assign value? Um, is it just financial return? Um, or is, it, is, is there a return on human capital? Is there a return on uh, natural capital, um, and then the capital markets themselves. Let me just, just say that that is a real challenge and has been in our place. One company town, when that paper company sold in the year 2000, it sold for $4.8 billion to a multinational. Mm, headquarters moved to Finland, and then of course there have been two or three now subsequent sales. 
The next sale was to a paper company in Ohio uh, that was actually owned by Cerberus Venture Capital. So really not a paper company, but owned by Cerberus Venture Capital. They declared bankruptcy mm, within a space of three years after extracting resources out of the community. They sold to another paper company called Verso, which is owned by Apollo Venture Capital. And uh, they declared bankruptcy less than 12 months after that sale and had taken a loan uh, out of the extracting resources out of the company. That most recently was probably 12 months ago. So in the, in the interest of short-term shareholder gain, um, there's not the lens on community um, and on having a voice in community. That last bankruptcy sale left a slew of debt in our community, including to us, for um, worker training programs that we had done for the, for the paper company. Mm -hmm. So that idea of how do the capital markets and what role do we play uh, in helping capital markets and business uh, recognize that the intersection of community and employer. And Molly, you, you get the last word on this. I'm thinking about what I imagine the textile industry in your part of the state used to be, which would have been really big factories employing lots and lots of people, and now it's much smaller scale. So is that part of the challenge for you, is that you're, you're replacing something, but you're not replicating it in the numbers that would have been there before? Exactly. So I think just because it's not the numbers is to discount it mm -hmm. or discount the impact that it can have. We know that through automation, anyway, we would have lost large numbers of people that were working in manufacturing anyway. So I, I think I want to echo what Rob is saying is about, about the narrative. There's a lot of positive things happening in rural communities, and it always seems like we're on the defensive. <laughs> we're never on the offense. We're never lifting up those stories. And so much of it is the image. Because I know from my generation that when you went to work in manufacturing, even though it's lean manufacturing, we're making really innovative products, it's going to all these name brands, it's, it's well-paid work, um, that was what you were seen to do is if you failed, if you didn't get to go get out. So there's this uphill battle against the image yeah. that we have for workers. And then I think ultimately there's also this, there's not a space and there's, and think in terms of kind of infrastructure, there's not a space in which workers can gather when workers, um, because again, we don't have labor unions that are representing us, where people can come together and have this shared analysis. So we represent organizations and these or organizations then represent hundreds of people. So where is it that those people are coming together for the shared analysis and how does that then relate to a political narrative for them as well? And I think we're really missing out on that infrastructural space. Mm -hmm. We heard in the, in the last panel with Bill and Charlie the notion of, of people feeling dispossessed, invisible, um, not listened to, not heard. And I wonder how much of that you're hearing from the communities where you are of people just feeling like they just don't get us here. They don't know what we're doing. They don't understand who we are or how we, how we function. Um, Kelly, you want to start? Um, so, yes, I, I mean, definitely here, uh, that idea of um, resentment, I would say, you know, there's, um, mm, and being overlooked, and, um, and not enough dialogue and work on our part to foster greater understanding about um, uh, not being overlooked mm, in, in place. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I would say there's some of that. Rob, mm -hmm. do you hear that as well? I think what, what we hear more, and this may be a spin on this, is an over-promise and under-deliver by those coming into a community. Um, the promise of jobs based upon maybe some um, uh, federal investment or tax credit type of thing. Um, the, uh, the, the, the guarantee of some mm -hmm. upside and the community is grasping at that is going, that's the silver bullet that's going to replace the one we lost. If you want to take the slide that is up there very quickly. Um, it's, uh, this is a mill town in Berlin, New Hampshire, and, and um, you know, over the years, I guess we're not going to get that slide. Anyways, the point is over the years, industry has replaced industry on the upper left. You can see the old paper mill, Brown Paper Company. Um, and the issue there is that continued disinvestment, as Kelly was, was saying, um, almost results in the community compromising for less and less about what they can retain, mm -hmm. both from a dollar value but from a pride in place. And I, I think it's just, it's... Um, that to me is more the, the disconnect. I, I don't hear the same amount of us and them as you, as, as you may. And 
and Molly, where you are? Because you're also dealing with a, a good chunk of your workforce is immigrants, right? That's right. And, and I think we, we forget <laughs> that we are a country of immigrants. And the largest employer in our county is a, is a weaving mill. They're doing some of the most amazing weaving in terms of technology. Um, Valdi's Weavers is the name of that. Um, a thousand person plant. Interestingly enough, uh, 18 months ago, they sold to their employees. So they're now 100% employee stock ownership program. Mm -hmm. So it's just this kind of amazing transition of where, you know, in, in my growing up, one person that owns a plant could make a decision that it leave. At least now the workers would have to make that decision about that plant leaving. That plant was started by Italian immigrants that came into my community, you know, five generations ago. So I think there's something that's really important that we remember that so much of what has driven manufacturing has been this influx of people into communities and into rural places. Um, so I, th I think there is a lot of disenfranchisement and there's a lot of blaming because the, all of our solutions, whether it's this session or any session we attend here, it's complex. There's a lot of complexity and I think we're trying to solve an entrenched problems but through, uh, through the complexity and mir mirroring that complexity. And one of those, it's so easy just to put the blame on someone. But if you go into these manufacturing networks that we're creating, it's actually the heads of these companies that are forming alliances, many of them Republican heads of companies that are forming alliances to go advocate for immigration reform. Now, interestingly enough, they're not going to do it publicly, but they are going to do it behind closed doors. So unfortunately, that doesn't get so much into the public narrative, but on the manufacturing side, people know that we need immigrant workers and people that then their children are not immigrant workers. Their children are simply workers of immigrant parents, and they are part of our fabric of our community. The elementary school I grew up in, it was 97% white. It's where my child, who goes now, who has both a US and a, and a Hispanic surname, it's now 80% Hispanic. And so I learned in my, our session this morning, there was a really phenomenal session on rebuilding American talent. 25% of our workforce will be Latino in the coming years. So Amer rural America is also a diverse America and an increasingly diverse America, and we need to remember that as well. Mm -hmm. I want to, I think it's time for questions. Yes. Um, we have a microphone. Why don't you put your hand up and tell us who you are and where you're from. Right here, Brian. Hi. Hey. Um, my name is Brian. Uh, I grew up in a rural Midwestern town, uh, but I've lived in a variety of rural and urban places. Uh, and right now, I'm a white, young, equity-minded educator in Minneapolis. Um, and I see so many people like me, uh, such that you know, people who want to reduce inequities along wh whatever line, uh, such that there's, like, there's even like a glut of, of applicants for such jobs. And there's um, uh, you know, people who, who can't get those jobs in the Twin Cities and end up you know, working at a microbrewery or working retail or whatever. And if I talk to someone like that, I'm thinking white in particular, because like, it's very different uh, being a person of color in rural America. But if I tell them, you know, there are these towns in, in outlying Minnesota that are a third Latino or like super, super mixed like meat packing plants that like need those voices for equity and need that good work being done. Usually they'll say, you know, well, I don't want to live around such closed minded people. Like I couldn't do that. Um, my hunch is that to get around that, it's like one, not demonizing people who think differently from you quite as much and realizing that someone who might even have you know, racist or homophobic beliefs is still a person and someone we have to work alongside to build our, our country and world. Uh, but then maybe two, that some of these rural communities, if they want to attract young people, uh, a commitment to, to equity and inclusion, especially along racial and, and, and gender lines, is probably what attracts a lot of people to cities. So my question, question. is, what, yeah. um, what builds that? Uh, what, what do you think can, can help create that? Thanks. What builds more inclusivity in rural communities? Is both, both the cities creating that and um, young people uh, maybe seeing uh, said settings differently. How to create more inclusive communities in rural America, I think, is, is what the question was. Um, Kelly? So multiple levels, right? There's culture, there's systems, and there's structures in place. And um, uh, at the base level, it's about having a relationship and one-on-one -on -one conversation with, other, with the other, right? Wh whoever the other might be in other perspective. Um, beyond that, uh, it's about um, advocacy and policies that uh, advance and support inclusion, right? Um, that, that model uh, new behavior, whether it's gender. Uh, uh, in our case, there are very few women in leadership positions in our community. Um, not very racially diverse. Um, 
and we have to be intentional in investing in and holding up um, uh, uh, individuals that are, um, that are different. Let's get you another can question. I, can I just say, just quickly, I think it's also about going back to this idea of narrative, that the narrative of equity and the narrative of you have enough for your family and your children, that's, we don't have to politicize that conversation. That's a deeply unifying human story, and we're all seeking that. You know? And so I think reminding people of, of, of that, that common narrative and that common humanity is extremely important. As you go and meet people and intentionally meet people that are very different from you, I think, as, as Kelly has said. Back here. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Harmon. I'm from Kansas City. Grew up in the uh, rural Great Plains, which is uh, in some cases disintegrating right now. So I have a lot of thought about it. I wonder, Molly, uh, <clears throat> how's Walter doing, bottom line, financially, benefits, uh, equity? How's he doing compared to what he would have been doing sure. in a traditional That's sense? That's a great question. I kind of left that out. I was trying to move us along. So it's interesting. So Walter went from working at the chicken processing plant I was telling you about to working two jobs. He left those two jobs to come and work at Opportunity Threads where he's making between $17 and $18 an hour. That's not something he would ever have made before. He just bought a lovely house. I wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. We work very closely with Self-Help Credit Union, um, which you might be familiar with in North Carolina. So he's not only the owner of a profitable business, so you know, our cut and sew, he's, he's an L a member of that LLC. He bought in at $5,000, um, so he's a full member of our LLC. He owns a business, he owns a home, he works, um, and I know that my plant is going to be okay while I'm gone because he's there in charge. His children are passing their end of grade tests, and so I think he would tell you, often with tears in his eyes, he has achieved the American dream, and he's also not only going to stop there, he's going to help give it to other people, and that's what I, I so admire about him, is his ability to now teach ownership and teach you know, nimble manufacturing. And I, I think it's really important when I hear, when I tell my story of manufacturing, in textiles, because so many people dismiss it, that it is not our end, it is our means. And our means is to build a new generation of workers. And that's what we're trying to do, starting with people just like him. And he wants to be in our community, and his daughter wants to go into manufacturing. Great question, thank you. Right here. <coughs> my name is Erica, and I am an admitted city dweller. Um, and my question is seeking truly to understand what I find difficult to understand. And this combines, in a way, the first session with the second one. So I do understand everything as you guys are saying. I'm finding it hard to understand the support of voters um, who are supporting someone who's doing things that threaten hospitals in rural areas. You know, someone who, looking at your beautiful forest, you know, has people doing things clearly threatening the environment, who's reversing policies to fight obesity, who's actively trying to decrease taxes on wealthy people. And I, it's a paradox. I can't understand giving all the things that you guys are both facing and the opportunities of the things you're advancing, how can that be a vote for myself um, if the groups and people I'm putting into power are virtually daily doing things that undermine my family and my ability to thrive? And I wonder whether, Charlie, if you, could you hear the question? I wonder whether we might steer this to you or to Bill if you want to jump in, because I think unless one of you wants to take a, quick, a crack at I it. I have a quick Go ahead. comment on that, um, and it would just relate to the cocktail reception last night when I was introduced uh, to someone, and he said, oh, rural central Wisconsin, you're the reason that we have Trump as president. Um, and, um, and I have thought long and hard in terms of um, why would someone vote against their own interest, right? Um, but I have the experience of losing that Fortune 500 paper company and having people crying, right? Grown men in their 50s crying and wanting that company back and wanting a savior. And when I hear on the campaign trail, coal is coming back and we're gonna reopen those coal mines, right? I was in Appalachia a year ago talking to coal miners 50-year-old men in the front row with tears in their eyes. Coal's not coming back. Those mines aren't opening up in the way that they were before. So there's, um, there's culpability in terms of stirring up fear 
and voting from a fear base, right, um, that, that is a responsibility of ours as a nation to undo. And Charlie, do you want to weigh in on why folks she might be not back. <laughs> voting against their economic self-interest? Well, I think we covered a little bit, and I, I give you a very, very short answer, because a lot of it is, and, and Bill Bishop points this out, that a lot of this is you know, cultural, value-based, but also it is a reflection of this tribalism in American politics you know, that, that really you know, is often about self-interest and economics, but often is not. You know, um, that, that if you convince folks that the others are responsible for it, um, if you play on that politics of resentment, by the way, a book I would strongly recommend anyone here, The Politics of, uh, uh, the book about resentment from uh, uh, Catherine Kramer from uh, University of Wisconsin, who really went out and talked to rural voters about this, trying to you know, answer this particular question. Um, I, I do think that a lot of it is this sense that we, we are working hard, we're playing by the rules, um, we have this culture which we feel is under siege. And when you get to 2016, for a lot of these voters it was a binary choice. And a lot of them, you know, were not necessarily voting for the candidate they voted for as much as they were voting against the candidate that they were opposed, that they really saw um, a real fundamental threat to their religious liberty, um, to their way of life, to their values, uh, in, in a way that I think was below the radar screen for a lot of folks here. But in a, in a binary world, you are willing to accept and vote for somebody who might be against your economic interest if he shares your values and your culture. And I think that's what Bill was getting at. Bill? Uh, just two points. One is uh, Bernie did better in rural areas than Hillary did, whereas in 08, Hillary did better in rural areas than... The other thing is, you can see where the resentment comes because we don't ever ask people at, on Central Park West why they vote against people with their, their economic <laughs> self-interest, right? I mean, for some reason, it's those weird rural people who do this strange thing about voting against their self-interest, and it's, it's easy to study down, and, uh, but we, we don't uh, study up uh, in terms of class very often. And, and so, you know, where does the resentment come from? You know, it's pretty easy to see. Hmm. Another question? Yes, in the green shirt. I grew up in West Texas. My name is Benton Kassman, and I grew up in West Texas, but I've also spent a good time in North Carolina. And I uh, just wanted to pick up on the fact that I'm glad to see you uh, bringing the textile industry back to Morganton. I know you're, you know, in kind of in between Boone and Asheville, but I was wondering if you, if you're working on trying to uh, further develop some other avenues like agritourism, uh, some ecotourism in that area, and kind of utilizing what's in that area, you know, to kind of help, you know, advance that area as a kind of a, you know, better e economy. It is something that a lot of communities are turning to, right? And Rob mm -hmm. talked about this yeah. as well. Is that something that's happening where you are, Molly? Yes, so I think, you know, not to keep going back to the slides, but what we really talk about, and you, you, you know exactly where we are, so thank you, <laughs> is um, an economic enclave. So I've spoken about textiles because that's what my plant does. But we also talk about our heritage manufacturing industries, which have really grown up together because the folks that are making furniture need the sewers, they need the fabric makers, they need the machinists, they need the metal workers, they need the woodworkers. So we think about this and what we have and what we don't want to throw out even though it's faced some economic challenges, are all our supply chains. Because there's hundreds of years of knowledge and hundreds of years of craftspeople that have done this work. So when we think about heritage manufacturing, it is the textiles. I also meet very frequently, and we have a network of furniture makers. Some of the finest furniture makers are still in Western North Carolina. The metal workers, and then also other, see, yes, um, agriculture, as well as what's really growing up in Western North Carolina is craft brew. You know, New Belgium moved to Western North Carolina <laughs> recently. So, um, and then I just got an email this morning as I was checking email that at, there's gonna be a new outdoor recreation center that's gonna focus on Western North Carolina. So it's really to think not just about this one industry, but our industries and our sister's industries to create that economic enclave. But the point I really wanna leave you with is unless we make that worker-centric, it's not okay just to be sustainable on an environmental level or just on an economic level. If we leave the worker voice out, 
then we're going to keep getting these votes. <laughs> we're right. not going to have a place for people and workers to analyze their political situation because, and that's, that I think is fundamentally what we need. And Rob, last yeah, word, I just Christine. want to tie these last two questions together. In many cases, when urban, I am going to, I'm just trying to pull these together, I'm going to separate. When urban people come up to recreate, industry is dirty. It doesn't look pretty. They want, they're like, can we get away with that because we want to come to this idyllic wilderness? Well, guess what? It's not a wilderness. And I think that's one of the big pieces that, they, that tourism does not drive a sustainable economic basis. And so I love, the, uh, I love the appreciation of manufacturing because I think what we're trying to do in a number of communities, post-industry communities, big paper, is look at a diversified economy that has smaller diversified, whether it be manufacturing, might be tied into tech in some regard, might be the brew pub but also that outdoor recreation experience because it makes for, for a much more diversified local economy where you appreciate the place and the people and the combination of year-round jobs. And I think we are out of time. Yes, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to our panelists, Molly, Rob, and Kelly, and also Charlie and Bill. Thanks so much.